Okay, so I've started the recording for uh, those that can't be with us. So you should see that little recording button up in the screen. Thanks for coming. Uh, maybe we'll get a couple more people pop in uh, as we're talking. So welcome back. Um, I have two main things Brandon and I want to talk about today. Um, the biggest topic is how to plan for a resilient course for this fall where you and your students individually or as a group may be stuck at home because of exposures or potential exposures. So that's, I think, where we want to spend the most time. Um, do want to make sure that we have time to talk about the new textbook to see if anybody has any questions related to the new textbook. Um, I also want to mention as we're getting started that Amy's not going to be joining us today, but wanted to make sure to let everybody know she's willing to help and says to email or text her if you have any questions. Um, normally, we would like your syllabus and calendar turned in by Monday. I know that you might be making some tweaks and modifications based on everything you've learned today. So I would just say, make sure you get that to uh, one of the three of us as soon as possible. Also, make sure you're adding the required diversity statement. So this past spring, the diversity committee um, asked the curriculum committee to have that added to our syllabi. And so um, it's a part of the official course syllabus, even if Fran hasn't got it uploaded yet. Um, we do have to have the diversity statement. And so I'll point that out on my syllabus that I shared with everybody this morning. So big topic is how are we gonna set up our face-to-face -face classes? So there was a, a term that came up uh, just yesterday and something I was reading online, which was a resilient course. And I loved that term, so I kind of stole it. But you have to think about the possibility that individual students that are enrolled in your face-to-face -face section will be forced to stay at home for two weeks or more at a time. And how do we make the course available to those students if they're stuck at home? And what do we do if ourselves as instructors are stuck at home? And what do we do if the whole class is stuck or the building is closed or the whole campus is closed. And so last spring, you kind of set up your, your class and your syllabus and your calendar for the old world. I call it the before times. Um, and then completely had to throw out the playbook and rewrite everything and, and kind of do everything at the last minute. So what I want to encourage everybody to do is set up a calendar, set up a syllabus, set up course policies and procedures that are flexible, that would meet all of these different possible realities we may encounter. And then when it happens, you don't miss a beat. You already have a plan in place and you can just quickly roll with the punches. Um, so one of the things I know that I'm going to do is I'm gonna check out one of those webcams from the library and I'm gonna take it to my very first day of face-to-face -face class. And I'm going to live stream and record my first face-to-face -face class. That way I have time to play around with the technology. So the first time I have a student stuck at home, I'll know how to use it. I'll know how it works with my classroom and I'll be ready to do that. And so that's one piece of advice I have is sometime next week, go down to campus or try to get to campus really early the day that you're teaching your first class, check out one of those webcams and they're supposed to be plug and play. So you're supposed to be able to just plug them right into the computer in your classroom and not do a bunch of setup. And you're, you, you're gonna take that to every room you teach in, you can use it at home, you're gonna, you're gonna have that available to you. Um, but what I wanna do is I shared this with you and I'm gonna, do this little present screen now. Um, that's a good question, Larry. I don't know. I think, I think um, you're going to be able to ask the library to send it to your mailbox in Arnold. 
but I would call the library to verify that for sure. Um, so this morning, and I sent this out in an email, um, I posted a couple of things in Blackboard. So if you go to our psychology adjunct community page in Blackboard, um, I have created sort of a modified syllabus based on COVID-19. I am not teaching Gen Psych in the classroom this fall, so I don't have a Gen Psych example, but you can use a lot of the same things that I'm doing in human development in terms of like course policies. So in the lifespan human development section of our um, adjunct community page, there's a folder for each class. And so in the folder for lifespan, I have this resilient course planning. And I put a couple of documents in there. Um, there is my syllabus. And in my syllabus, I put everything that was like COVID modifications in red font. So it'd be really easy to kind of stand out and you could scan and find those easily. Um, I put a copy of my course calendar. Um, I'm not changing any due dates. All of my work was already submitted online, so I don't really have to change my course calendar. Um, and then I have a course access information document I share with my students regarding all the technology they need for the class. And so I put that in there. Um, but what I wanted to pop open was the document that just shows my modifications. And so I have for kind of each section of my course, you can see how I have it set up. And so here's just one example. I'm not gonna go through the whole thing, but in the methods of instruction for my face-to-face -face class, I tell them, this is supposed to be a synchronous face-to-face -face class. However, <laughs> you might have to stay home. And so I kind of have it set up with, here's how it will work if you as an individual are supposed to stay at home, I am going to be streaming my face-to-face -face classes live. So I'm gonna bring that webcam to class so they can participate live in real time from home if they choose to. I'm also gonna record those live sessions and post them in Blackboard so they can participate asynchronously if they choose to. Um, I have little explanation here about what if the instructor is stuck at home? What if the whole class is quarantined for two weeks? Um, and so I'm planning, and you don't have to do what I'm doing, but I'm planning is if I'm stuck at home, I'm going to do what I did this past spring, which is I'm going to do synchronous classes. They can participate in real time or I'm going to record those and put them in Blackboard. And then I think you also have to think about what if you're not only stuck at home, but what if you're sick? You know, what if you aren't able to do a live session? Um, and so you need to kind of have planned out some things that they could do asynchronously if you're out for a week because you're sick. And it could be the flu. I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be COVID, right? You could be stuck at home um, and can't, necessarily participate live or you've got a tech issue and your home internet is down and, and the charter guy can't get out to fix it for a week. Um, so there's lots of reasons why you might be asynchronous. Um, so I put that document on there. It's a Word doc. So you can cut and paste and edit and take a look at it. Um, so I sent that out. Uh, the other thing I'm going to do with my syllabus, and I'll show you what my syllabus looks like. So you can kind of see. I have my normal syllabus, and then I have up there at the top, I say COVID-related modifications are noted in red font. I'm going to keep mine in red font because I want a student who is stuck at home to quickly be able to scan the syllabus for I'm stuck at home, right? Um, but you can see my syllabus is my normal syllabus my normal methods of instruction section, and then this extra piece is, is tagged on there. Um, what I'm planning to do with my syllabus is I'm gonna do an activity called annotate the syllabus with my students, where I'm gonna put the syllabus in 
uh, a Google Doc where the students can comment on it. And I'm going to ask them to go through and annotate the syllabus by putting in comments where they ask questions or express concerns. And my syllabus is not going to be set until after my second meeting with my students. So I'm going to post it so that they can see it the first class. And I'm going to tell them by the start of the second class, I want them to go in and annotate my syllabus. And that way, there's maybe something I didn't think about, some concern that I, I don't even have in my head right now. That way, my, my syllabus is going to be a little flexible until my, my second class meeting with the students. And then we'll kind of firm it up and I'll say, OK, this is the syllabus subject to change. <laughs> as always. Um, so those are a couple of things. Um, we talked about streaming, recording, posting the meetings, checking out the webcam. Um, another thing you want to think about is how do you do group activities? Your students are going to be six feet apart wearing masks. I am heavy group activity. It's going to be really difficult to do something that, that they're going to interact using their voices. Um, I'm asking my students to bring earbuds or headphones with an integrated microphone. And what I'm going to do with my students is I'm going to put them into breakout rooms in Google Meet. So if I have some students stuck at home and some students in the classroom, they can have a little Google Meet conversation with their, their headphones and their microphone. And we don't have to suddenly have everybody yelling in the classroom. Think about the logistics of that. If you're doing a group activity in your individual classroom and you have your students all yelling across the room at each other, what's that going to sound like with the classroom next door? Um, it's going to make it real difficult. My classroom, again, it's human development. It's a computer classroom. If you're not in a computer classroom, they can use their phones. So have them bring their phone. They can use Google Meet on their phone, bring their earbuds that go with their phone. And then you can actually do a group activity without people yelling across the room. And you can include anybody at home who's live participating. So that's one idea to kind of think about. Um, another idea is if you have students that are stuck at home and students that are in the classroom and you're sort of teaching them both at the same time and your students from home are asking questions on the chat, it's going to be really hard for you to keep track of the chat. So one other tip that I, I read this week is to ask um, one of your classroom students to be the voice of the chat. And they can say, hey, there's a chat question so that you don't miss a question or a comment from online. Or what I'm going to do is I'm going to put um, slides in my PowerPoint that are just called chat checks. And periodically, I'm going to stop and say, OK, you know, we, we talked about the, the neuron. Let's stop and check for understanding and see if people have questions or comments. Um, so that's another uh, good idea that I heard this week. So I'm going to do a chat check. <laughs> so I'm going to say, turn on your microphone. Do you have questions about what we've talked about so far? Comments, concerns? I looked over your syllabus and I saw a lot of things I left out of mine. So that was helpful. Thank you. And you don't have to do it exactly how I've done it, but I think seeing me address something in my syllabus will help you think about how you want to address it in your particular class. This is not the only way to run a class. This is just the way I've come up with. <laughs> It's always helpful helpful to not have to reinvent the wheel. <laughs> yes. 
So that's a great, it's a great model to base everything off of. And I would just say with every piece of your syllabus, think about those four different ways that you might be teaching this semester. Everybody all in the same room, some students at home, everybody at home, or you can't even teach. And kind of with each section of your syllabus, look at, does this apply? Would this work under all these different scenarios? Because I didn't, I kind of had to redo a lot of my syllabus last spring. I don't want to have to do that. I want to create something that will just work. I was, I was trying to think that direction, Leslie, and you know, I don't know if I'm going the right direction or not, but <laughs> I tried to set up because I was so um, lost when we went last semester to online. I really had no idea what I was doing. I felt like I did, I did a real injustice. So this semester, I really tried to focus that direction mm -hmm. and I set up all my uh, weeks in modules so that should we go online, they would just go right to the module and each day is set up. Is that, is that okay? I mean. Yeah, that's okay. I, I actually have, have rewritten how I'm going to do the fall about a thousand times. Um, I initially, when I first started, I actually created a whole module based calendar where I was like, okay, if we have to switch to all online, I'll switch to this module based calendar. And then I threw it out because I said, you know what? The reason why we did the module based calendar last spring was one, we lost a week of instruction. So we had to kind of deal with the fact that we lost a week. And because so much of what we used was based on the online course that was set up with weekly modules, it just worked out. Um, I'm actually just going to stick with my same normal calendar, my same normal deadlines, um, because I'm not going to lose a week this year. Uh, we'll just be a smooth transition. If, if we have to stay home, you're not going to get a week to prep. It's going to be okay. All of a sudden you wake up Monday and your class is stuck at home because of an exposure. We're still having class. We're still sticking with our calendar. Everybody needs to be ready to just pivot very quickly. So if you find it more helpful to do it in, in a weekly module, that's fine. I personally am sticking with my normal calendar. I, I tried to set up my uh, weeks according to my calendar so that they could match. Yeah. So it just, I'm not a very organized person and that helped me stay organized. Yeah, and it may help the students too because they are not always very organized either. So the more yeah. organized you can be, the better for them. Um, okay, so, um, I wanted to address uh, Larry's question. Um, students have an excuse for not attending class. So I think that kind of speaks to what we're talking about here is, is designing the course in ways that um, there's multiple options to participate and complete work that if you're not in class, here's, here's, this, here's what you have to do. You, you do it from home um, and offering flexibility with that. And I was at some point I wanted to talk about Google forms. I don't know how much people are using them. Mm -hmm. um, that I, I started relying on that a lot last spring. Uh, and um, I use a fair amount of group stuff. I don't think I'm as group heavy as Leslie is, but and, and my group stuff looks kind of follows the think fair share model more that they do a lot of writing in class. And historically they would would either post like discussion questions in, in my PowerPoint. Or I would have physical handouts that they would do stuff and I would collect that. So I'm not trying to not have any paper. Um, so I've, I've converted all most of that to Google Forms. Um, it's, it's, that's really nice to that. Ever, you know, your, your participation, I call them participation assignments. Um, I like Cheryl, I think you've used like exit tickets, stuff like that. Google Forms is great for all of that. Um, so that's a way that, hey, here's here's what we're working on in class today. Here's uh, the activity I have for you to do. If you can't come to class, no problem. Uh, you still have to do the activity. You still have to complete it. And then I think, you know, probably 
offering more flexibility than I would have in the past in terms of, yeah, I, I didn't feel well today. I'll, I'll do it this weekend. Whereas in the past, I might have been like, might have been more strict with those types of things. I'll be more flexible now. Um, obviously, I'm going to communicate to students. You haven't done your participation activities for a month. And then you come in and say, hey, I need to make all this stuff up. That's not going to fly. But um, if you're communicating with me, um, you know, we'll, we'll make it work. So that's that's one way to consider with that participation and attendance. So the and I would just say that we don't want students to feel like they have to come to class when they're not feeling well or they think they might have been exposed. So we don't want students to feel like they have to hide that they might be sick or might have been exposed and that they're somehow going to be punished or or miss out or have to jump through some sort of extraordinary hoops to not come to class. If you don't feel well, I don't want you in the room, right? If you think that you might have potentially been exposed, I don't want you in my room, right? And so you want to set the class up in such a way that they don't have to present a doctor's note if they have the sniffles, right? So you want to have a little bit more flexibility in terms of late assignments and this ability to participate asynchronously offline. And so when I first set up my, my course in one of the thousand iterations, I was like, Oh, well, you have to have DSS accommodations for your COVID stay at home, you know, and then you can stay at home and, and do all this work. And then, like, I woke up one morning at six o'clock in the morning with a panic going, oh, God, no, no, I want them to stay home if they feel sick. And I got to completely rewrite the syllabus so that they know they can just stay home and it's OK. Um, and so if if you look at each one of my types of assignments, you know, I have my normal, you know, do the assignment when it's due. But, you know, if you're sick the day you're supposed to do your presentation in class, that's okay. Right? So I, I tried to make it clear, and, and this will probably get clear after my students annotate the syllabus and we have a back and forth conversation that if you don't feel well, you stay at home and just let me know. Just let me know what's going on. And if you're sick and you can't participate in class live and you can't complete the asynchronous work by the due date, I will tell you my synchronous and asynchronous. Let me go up to that section in my syllabus here and I'll show you real quick. Um, So normally, you know, my in-class activity points, you have to be there to earn them. But if you're staying at home, you can participate synchronously the same day of that class. Or if you do asynchronous, I want them to do it, still do it the same day by the end of the day. But if you're sick at home and you've talked to me, you can do it later than that. And so... Um, I don't want anybody to come to class if they've been exposed or think they might have been exposed or wake up not feeling well and feel like, well, it's probably not COVID. I'm still going to go ahead and go. Like, just stay home. Um, you also may have people who have kids. Jefferson County um, has a lot of schools where the kids are going two days a week. And that's going to create a burden on any of our uh, students who are also parents. Now, if a student has to care for children at home, and that is going to uh, limit their ability to come to campus, we're actually asking them to take online versions of the class. But we're still going to end up with people who are in our classes, our face-to-face -face classes, who have kids at home, or maybe they're going to school and then they get sent home, who then suddenly can't come to class because their kid is stuck at home. And so I think 
thinking about being a flexible, understanding person in these crazy times and how do I set up the class so that it's equitable is just a thought process you kind of have to have in your head as you look at your syllabus and your course policies and procedures. Um, Google Forms is great, Brandon. I wanted to, to piggyback on that a little bit. Um, Google Docs, live Google Docs, I use that a lot in um, my honors site class. We do a lot of work in live Google Docs together. Um, you can do that offline, online. Um, there's Google Jamboard. There's a bunch of different Google applications where you can be have everybody in the room in the same Google app at the same time working together. Um, Quizlet is another thing. So I used to do in my human development class, I would give them, we do kind of like a Jeopardy-ish activity where I would give them a note card with an answer on it. And the next class period, they would come back with the note card with the question written on the other side. And we do kind of a think pair share activity in class with those note cards at the start of every class. I can't do that. <laughs> no paper. And I don't want them to go find their partner and talk close together about, you know, their think pair share. So I'm going to do it in Quizlet. You can set up a Quizlet that the students add to. And so I've already got my first two Quizlets set up where I'm going to say, all right, do your, do your question in, um, in Quizlet instead of using the paper. So think about, anything you can do to minimize paper because you don't want to have to exchange papers back and forth as much as possible. Um, quizzes for the new textbook. Um, Brandon has already created quizzes that he already has built in Blackboard. He used the new textbook over the summer. And so he has quizzes for each of the units that are 20 to 25 questions. Um, I have question banks and pools of questions built from the new textbook, but I haven't applied those yet to quizzes. So I will be building those throughout the semester, but mine are all going to be 20 questions. Um, so if you want access to either one of those resources, let Brandon or I know. Um, and then the other big thing is exams. Now we've talked a lot about how to do in-class activities. Quizzes are easy because we'll just put them at Blackboard, so, so that's easy. Our uh, projects, you're probably already having them submit papers in Blackboard, so you don't have to, to really make a lot of changes with how you do the papers or the projects. Um, but exams. How are you going to do an exam when you've got three or four students quarantined at home? How are you going to do an exam with limiting paper? Um, it's going to become pretty complicated. <laughs> um, so I'm going to actually let Brandon talk about his plan for exams, and then I'll talk about my plan for exams. Um, we'll say with caution, this is all appending Terry's approval mm -hmm. I'm going to do and this is what I did in the summer um that was with a class of 12 people so I don't think he'll have any problems with me continuing this but um I did send him an email I know he was he's been out of the office so um awaiting his approval on that but um, what I did in the summer is, is, is basically what we did with the spring exams is I used the new textbook um question bank. I developed exams based off those um, so that they're pulling from a huge uh, question bank, class bank. And Leslie, can you unshare your screen so I can share mine? Thank you. Um, and I want to show how I set up the options. Um, let me get this turned on. How I set up the options in Blackboard just to make sure. So mm -hmm. Um, this is just, I created this for this, and I labeled it um, exam one, you know, summer 2020 hybrid, just uh, so I could track that and make sure I knew what, it, what that was for. Um, so I set it up in this way, and I can take screenshots, post these, share these. 
on force completion set timer is 50 questions, 50 minutes auto submit. That's necessary. So when you, if you have students with DSS accommodations, if they get extended time, you can add that in. If you want also, if like if you make this, you know, available until, you know, Sunday at midnight, you have a student who is sick and you need to extend the time, you can extend the time in here for a particular student. Um, and correct me, Leslie, if I'm wrong with how I've set this up. So I, I made set this up so that um, students are not getting any feedback, so they can, they're not seeing the questions once it's submitted. Um, I randomized the questions, and I prohibited backtracking. Uh, so that's what I'm recommending if you're using, uh, if you follow this format. So my format is that all of my exams are going to be online in Blackboard. Um, and for my input, face-to-face or um, online classes to so that there, I'm not going to do class, uh, tests in person. Um, so it's pulling from that. And I set up the tests so that each question pulls from a huge test bank. Um, at randomizing the questions, what that does, as Leslie had mentioned your son who was doing, is that um, it, him and his buddies would take their exams together, whether from different rooms uh, or different houses, right, wherever they were, and they would say, okay, question one, it might be a different question, but it's all over the same topic. So randomizing the questions should control for that, that they're in complete random order. So even if they're not getting like, hey, all of our question one is about Freud, and all of question two is about Skinner, it'll, it'll randomize that. Um, and then I turn off, I prohibit the backtracking. What I've found is that even, you know, with a 50 item test, my students, the average completion time is 30 to 35 minutes. Um, so my concern was that students are going to have on average 20, the average student will have 20 minutes, then go backtrack and screenshot, take pictures of the, of the items. And it wouldn't take too long where students could gather a, a large portion of the test items. And, and we know those get posted online rather quickly. Um, so I think with that, those, those cautions in place will prevent most of that from happening. Um, and in my summer class, um, my hybrid class that met on Google Meet, I only had 12 students, so it's a small sample size, but it worked pretty well. Um, grades were typical of what I would see. It wasn't like everyone was getting 100 on the test. It was the, you know, a good range of people failing to people you know, getting 98 cents, you know, one or two people. So I felt pretty good about that. Um, for me, that helps with, with the equity issue of not having alternate exams of like, hey, my, I faced the people who were able to attend the class in person, we got the 50 item test that I wrote. Um, for people who have to take it online are getting the test point from the huge test bank. It kind of makes it equal. I think from an instructor perspective, It'll make it easier for us to manage. Hey, I had I had 20 students miss the exam on test day, and now I have to go create the alternate exam, open that up for a black order, send it to the testing center, that whole mess, which is messy during normal times. Frustrating <laughs> um, the amount of students who miss test day. I'll knock all of that out. But hey, and, and so my plan, and again, this is a thing that, that Terry's okay with this, that he said. He says that's okay. I don't foresee he'll have a problem with it, but it's just a, I'm going to kind of set it up in a module format that, hey, exam one is due Sunday at midnight. You can take it whenever you want. You know, you get one, you get one attempt, um, and that that's for everyone. Uh, Terry will be back in the office on Monday. Um, so, and again, this is what I did in the summer. He was, and I consulted with him. He was supportive of that, so I don't see that being an issue. That's the approach I. I'm going to take, I think that'll make it easier for students, it'll be flexible, and it'll be easier for us that we're not trying to find five different ways to administer exams and, you know, doing like that constant email of missing exams, testing center, being in the grades, then some being papers, some being, you know, having different tests and all that, I think that'll be the best way to, to proceed. And I'm planning something not exactly the same. So my my tests will all be in Blackboard. 
Um, again, for human development, we're in a computerized classroom. So I have the advantage of students in my classroom will take the test in Blackboard versus having like a paper version and a non-paper version. So the test is going to be the test. It's going to be in Blackboard for everybody. Um, but I'm going to tell them that, you know, they can come to campus and they can take it during our class session or they can stay at home and take it. But for my students, they're going to take it all at the same time. And so I'm not doing as much with the randomizing of the questions and all of the things that Brandon is doing because everybody's going to be testing at the exact same time. So my class is from noon to 1.15. So we are going to all take the test at noon on Monday. Everybody's testing at the same time. Um, I'm actually going to ask the people that are testing from home to, and again, this is Terry dependent approved and if it works, um, I'm going to have them in individual Google Meet windows so that they can't just be on the phone with each other talking about the test in real time because um, they will because my son did it all last spring <laughs> for his college classes. If you allow it, they will do it. Um, and of course, you have to set this up with the idea that it's going to be open note, open book. You can't tell them that they can't use their notes if they're at home. So my students in the room are going to have that capability as well. Um, there is going to be a time limit. And so that's the other thing that I think is helpful is if you have a time limit on it, they can't look up every single question online. And think about changing up the wording of a question. So if you use a question from the question bank, I guarantee you it's available online somewhere in the world. But if you change that question up a little bit, um, it won't appear in a Google search quite as easy. And so, you know, there's a couple of different things that you can do. But my students are all going to test on the same day at the same time. Um, it's just going to make it a lot easier, I think, for me. But I think I'm still, I, I told Chris uh, DeGear, because he and I were in communication a lot about some of the stuff in my syllabus last week. And I was like, I'm still not quite sure about exams. If that's still something I'm, I'm struggling to figure out. Um, the Respondus software does have the ability to lock their browser. So if you want them to have no access to anything on the internet, on the device that they're using, you can use this Respondus lockdown browser. Um, I've never used it. Um, I've heard that it's a little bit buggy and has problems, but, but I, can't, I can't speak personally about how well it works or doesn't work. Um, and it doesn't prohibit them from having a second device <laughs> sitting nearby all fucked up that they're looking stuff up on the internet. So, you know, it's not perfect. I, I, there's a Respondus training session that I'm planning to go to. Um, Larry, have you used it? I've used Respondus a lot. And after I used it in, I taught five different classes all kinds and all of a sudden the, the one it, it became more problem than it's worth as far as two different devices how many people do you know they don't have a, they have a computer a tablet and a phone so all you're doing is forcing them to open up their phone instead of having instead of looking it up on the same computer which they may do anyway and the the other problem is and that's for, so for the and the people who are going to that, they don't even have to be tech savvy these days to be able to have that. So Respondus, though, becomes more of a pain in the neck, to be perfectly honest, because, I mean, a colossal pain in the neck, because it's not going to affect anybody for with average amount of, with even a sub-average amount of skill. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's not. But what's going to happen is for the people who are really weak skilled and maybe technologically challenged, they are not going to have any idea. All of a sudden, what happened is you have two or three people who have real issues. Well, what happens is 
they start saying, well, I couldn't take the test. I called tech support. They couldn't help me. It didn't work. And then you get emails from tech support saying you did something wrong when it's not, it's a when they have to go at it a different way. It became a nightmare. So all so that the per, and the only thing it does is force the person to use their cell phone while taking the test instead of using the same computer they're on. It is a waste of time. Respond as that's what I've heard a lot of people say. I think the only thing that's potentially good about it is they can't copy paste. They would have to type in the question into their alternate device, but that's about it. And have I you think seen their thumbs? Man, have you seen them type? I mean, it, it, <laughs> it's not going to slow them down at any at, at, at all. And then half of them are like, okay, you sometimes have in a class, you'll have a bunch of people, you have one person who will literally tank the test in order to copy the whole thing. Everybody else gets a copy of it. And then the next round on the, for the next quiz, they get a high grade and somebody else gets a low one and, and that kind of thing. But it, it's honestly more trouble than it's worth. It, and it's, it, it, and then for the people, it becomes a technological nightmare for getting the people who have difficulty. And and that's why I think a lot of the things that Brandon's talking about with random pools of items and randomizing the questions kind of prevents one person from taking the test and then sharing it out with everybody. Um, you know, for me right now, what I'm thinking is they're all going to test at the same time. So, you know, it'll be more like a normal face to face class. But again, I have computers in my classroom, so that allows me to do some things that, that maybe you can't. And so Brandon teaches, I think, all of his face-to-face -face gen psych uh, classes are in regular classrooms without computers. And that's why he's just gonna open up his test for a period of time mm -hmm. and not even give it during class time. Yeah, that's that's what I've done also. And I do it, actually, I'll, I'll ask the class about what, uh, you know, uh, well, have to do it more virtually, but ask the class what time would be good for them to take the test. If everybody is free after seven o'clock, well, okay, you have the time limit. You have everybody taking it at the same time, not the class time, uh, when they can take the test. Mm -hmm. And then also use randomizing questions as well and time limits to make it a little bit so everybody's taking it at the same time not at the class time with randomization seems to be fairly effective at least that's what i've done so. yeah and i think um it would take a very concerted pre-planned effort to try to gather questions and distribute them that um i don't i don't think is is really possible or our students aren't going to put if they're going to put that much effort into their tests it's going to be in their preparation so and, and it's it's certainly not ideal, but I think it controls as, as about as well as we can offering the flexibility we want to offer. And I think equity is something you really have to think about. And that was one of my big concerns with Respondus is you have to have an even more robust internet connection because you're running Blackboard and Respondus at the same time. So it really... It, it, down, it strains and, the freezes. and they have to have a working camera and microphone and they don't always have that. And so it's just oh. burden upon burden upon burden. And we have a lot of students who might have internet access that works well enough to do like everybody's off, the whole house is banned and I just have Blackboard open on just my computer and I can like cross my fingers and do it at like, you know, the low low time and I can do it with my kind of crappy home internet. So we really have to think about equity. Um, some people some people still have dial up. Believe yeah. it or not, some people still have dial up. Some people have direct TV or a lot of people actually have direct TV, which is a much slower connection than cable. And it can be, you know, I mean have you know I usually tell them turn off everything because you know if you're gonna use your computer and it freezes you have a lot of people on at the same time pick, pick a low a time where people are not on their phone computers that kind of thing there's no competition uh that is because it's going to slow everything down and right <laughs> and we're still going to have people going it froze it crashed what do i do how do i get back in 
and that's still going to be an issue. Yeah, I had I had asked Terry for the summer if I should use Respondus, and he just told me no. <laughs> don't even <laughs> don't even try it. So that's I I haven't even thought about it anymore since then. So that's and you may have students that that their only access is their cell phone. Oh, um, I do want to say that in the past, using your cell phone to take like a quiz, like I've never tried it with an exam, but quizzes and exams are the same in Blackboard, hasn't always worked. And so um, the, the Blackboard mobile application that they can download onto their phones is crap. <laughs> it, it's horrible. And if you find that students in your classes are completely lost, especially you, Larry, since you're teaching a, a totally online section, <laughs> if, if you're finding that they like, I can't find anything and where is everything? It doesn't have. Ask them if they're using the mobile app and then tell them to throw it out, delete it. Um, <laughs> it it's terrible. And so if you ever look at your class from a student perspective in the mobile app, you will say, well, half my class materials aren't even on here. Um, it's it's terrible. It'll go away once we get Canvas. The Canvas app is way better. It is. Here's the thing: while the Canvas app is better, it's better. I, I use Canvas, right? It, you know, because not always here. But basically, that it, it is much much better. It is not. I mean, but it's still not perfect, and you still don't have everything. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so definitely kind of be cautious about if you decide to go with Brandon's route with setting up the exams in Blackboard and everybody's taking them from home. Think about um, having the students take a quiz under the conditions that they're planning to take the exam. So if they're going to be in the McDonald's parking lot on their phone, then, then have them take a quiz like that so that it's not the middle of the test when the, the tech doesn't work. Um, because this is going to be a stressful semester for the students, and, and we don't want them to be in a, a higher stakes exam situation and things aren't working for them. Test everything out ahead of time in terms of a tech tool so that when the students have to do it for credit, they know how to use it and how it works. And I also made, since I was adjusting the test options in Blackboard, um, I adjusted that my quiz options were identical, um, even though that's not how I normally did it, just in terms of like randomized, no backtracking, all that time, the strict time limit. Um, or that way, so that they were like, quizzes was practice for the same conditions they'll see in the test. So I usually give students more time on the quizzes. I adjusted that, so it's a minute per question, no backtracking, randomized questions, so that they, as much as you tell students, hey, the, the test is different than the quiz, they won't listen, um, or they'll forget that. So that way they were uh, accustomed to those conditions when they're, when they're working on the test, that it's not a surprise, it's not different. How do we import yeah. from the adjunct Blackboard page? So if you have like a test, a Blackboard quiz you want to download, well, that you want to put in your well, Blackboard? Brandon's going to put his uh, uh, materials yeah. on black on the uh, adjunct Blackboard page. How do we import those into our class, like those quizzes and such? Yeah, I can show you real quick, Brandon, if you'll stop presenting. Okay, now I have to present. So give me just a second here. Present now. So there's already a test bank in there that I'm going to show you how to do it with, which is the APA style quiz test bank. Um, but what you'll do is you'll find the file. And so for the APA style quiz, I have it, it's set up, it says, APA style seventh edition quiz in Blackboard format. What you're gonna do is you're gonna download the file and save it on your computer. 
then you're going to go into your Blackboard class and you're going to import to your class. And so that's under course tools, test surveys, pools and tests and import. So I'm just going to do it real quick so you can see it. But I have the instructions for how to do it here. So I'm going to click on it. And my download has downloaded. It says text export file and it has a bunch of numbers. Um, then I'm going to go over to my Blackboard course I want to put it in. I'm going to go back to my Blackboard. I'm going to pick a class that I haven't done anything in yet. So here. So this is a blank class. It doesn't have anything in it right now. But I'm going to go down to my course tools. Test, surveys, and pools. And in this case, I'm importing a test. Um, you can also import pools of questions, which is what I do, um, is I create these pools that will randomly draw. But for this case, you're doing a test. And up at the top, it says build the test or import the test. Well, I'm importing something somebody else has already done. I'm going to browse my computer. It's in my download file here, that test export file, lots of numbers stuff. Open. And then you'll see it here, the file name. My, my co-presenters are helping. Um, <laughs> I'm going to click Submit. And then it's going to take a little bit of time to process the package. So the bigger the, the amount of questions in that file, the longer it's going to take. Mine took no time at all. So it says the import has been completed. Click OK. And now you can see that exists here as a test. If I want to put that in my class, um, I don't have any course content in this class, so I'm going to have to to go to the course content page here. So let's say I had a page here called quizzes. Um, so I'm going to add a test. And all of the tests that have already been created will be listed here that I don't already have deployed in my in my class. So I'm going to select the one I imported, APA style 7th edition, submit. And then it's going to automatically upload it where you can fix you know, the test description, the instructions. This is where you could go and fix those settings that Brandon was talking about. So I'm going to make this available. This is a quiz and not a test. So they're going to get multiple unlimited attempts. I want to automatically record the highest grade because this is a quiz. Um, you know, I'm going to set my timer if you wanted to have a timer, auto submit on, all those things that Brandon talked about. Um, you might set a due date. If I was doing this under test conditions, then I would say, you know, no feedback. And then if I want to set it up the way Brandon talked about, I'm going to say present each question one at a time, prohibit backtracking you know, randomize the question. So I can go and I can choose those settings right here. Click Submit. And now in my course content, the quiz is set up. And so if my student wants to take the quiz, they would go to course content, or I would call this quizzes myself. Like I said, I, I put this in a blank Blackboard shell. Um, and so they would come in, and you can see how it's set up. Give them one question at a time. So they can come in, they can answer that question, and they can't backtrack. So it says, moving to the next question prevents changes to this answer. So are you sure? <laughs> this is really what you want that answer to be. You know, so they would pick their answer. And then if, if I go to the next question, I'm locked in. I can't say, oh, crap. That, was, that wasn't the answer I wanted to, to pick. Does that make sense? So if you do this with one of the quizzes Brandon has built, and I'll put mine in there, it's easy. Um, 
if you want to have Brandon's quizzes just all loaded in there automatically, um, you guys can coordinate with uh, Karen Hester and she can actually copy stuff in. Um, what I have done in the past is I've asked permission to have access to your Blackboard class and then I can just copy all of my quizzes in versus you doing it piecemeal. You know, there, there's a variety of different ways we can do this. But it's pretty easy. Um, so that's a lot of, of questions about running class this fall in in the new world that we all live in um any other questions about that i want to make sure we have time to talk about the new book everybody's good yeah okay so i'm going to go back to presenting the screen just for a second because i want to make sure everybody has seen the learning guides that we posted so let's see. And Brandon actually taught with the new book over the summer. So he may have some, some other tips and tricks and advice to add. But in our, our adjunct community psychology shell that we have, we have each course organized. And we've got instructor um, resources for you to use. So we have created learning guides for all the required material for the new textbook. So you can click on that and it's in a Google folder where you can make copies and save these in your own folder and do whatever it is you wanna do. Um, there are two learning guides for every chapter. One is the one that I typically give my students And this is just the learning objectives, right? Describe the scientific process. The other one is one that I use to help me uh, write tests and, and uh, craft instruction. It has a little bit more of an outline. So it would have like, here's what you wanna cover about this. And so, you know, one of the learning objectives is about the major historical perspectives in psychology. And so I have like each of the perspectives and some of the key terms and names and things that I'm going to be, you know, wanting the students to know. So when I write test questions, I know what level of detail and what kind of terms that I, I wrote for them. So that's one set of resources. Um, I also went through and created sample calendars for how I would pace this material if I were teaching it um, this fall. So the sample calendars are, are organized based on how the classes are taught. So if you're a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Monday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Thursday, I created a calendar for every iteration um, just because I've never taught with this material before and I had to kind of think, think it through. So there's one for every iteration. I, I have an online one, Larry, but I don't think I loaded it up here yet. So I can, I can share that with you. Oh yeah, that'd be great. Um, and I'll, I'll put it in here too. I just, I did it a little bit after I did all of these. Um, you don't have to follow this. This is just this is how much time I would spend, and they're Word docs, so you can cut, paste, edit, do whatever you want. Um, but it was basically, I gotta pull this down here. Sorry, I'm, I'm on a dual monitor situation here, so sometimes what I think I'm doing is not what I'm doing. Um, I can't get it to show my Word doc right now with my dual monitors, but but anyway, I I've, I've got um, I've got those created, 
you don't have to pace it the way I would, but that's just how I would do it. Um, Brandon, what other tips and, and tricks and things about the new textbook do you want to mention? Um, I would say uh, I really like this textbook. Um, I really disliked our previous textbook, so um, it, I think it's a huge improvement. I love, um, it has a lot of great anecdotal examples that I think like case studies and things help support the content that are pretty interesting. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a huge improvement. Um, and I think that also like I, one thing that chapters first look thick, then after teaching through it, a lot of the content is like anecdotal supporting information. And so I think that's good. It's, it's brief, a little more brief than the last one has more examples, more explanations. Um, I think the infographics are really, really great. Um, I've used those in my materials and my PowerPoints to, to talk off them. I would caution any textbook against just using the PowerPoint that the textbook company generated because it's basically an annotated version of the chapter. <laughs> um, so, um, and I'll have my PowerPoints to post. Um, I'm going to turn on. Um, I know a lot of people aren't going to like my PowerPoints because there's basically nothing in them. Um, <laughs> students don't like them for that reason because I got tired of um, them complaining that they couldn't write stuff down, so I just took all of it off. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, it's not like something you can follow without you know, having your own materials, own preparation. So, um, you know, so like, and, and everyone's different. Some people don't want to use these in the PowerPoint. So like, I cover the scientific method. This is the only slide I have. I just talked through some of these things. I, you know, I've used these a lot. And I'll change this. You know, I've, I've tried some of this out. I'll change things. So like, um, you know, I talk about what a case study is. This is my slide. Um, you know, so I, I don't have a lot of content. I, I've tried to remove as much text as possible off the slides, as if you put text on there, they will write it down, um, and they, or they will attempt to, and then they get frustrated if they don't have time to. So that's what mine look like. Um, you can use those if you want, edit as you want, use your own, whatever you want to do. So I would caution against just downloading the, the ones that the textbook publisher has generated and going through that because it I think it when they're like 60 70 slides per chapter and then it's it kind of encourages you to lecture too much then you feel like you have to talk through every point and then they want to write down everything so um, that's what I did um, summer and I, I change things every semester so I'll have those. I'll be posting those things this week uh, that you can use if you want to. Um, also, from the textbook, all like those infographics, everything there is. If you have access to the publisher's website, you can pull any any of those, any of the infographics that are in the textbook. If they're not in the PowerPoint they generated, you can pull all those. There's a section for that. So if you want to take something that I didn't put in you see in the textbook that's not in their PowerPoint, you have access to all that, know that. Uh, I think it has a lot of great resources, a lot of good materials. So I'm, I'm excited about it. Uh, I think it's a much better option. Um, with any textbook, there are some things it doesn't cover. I wish it did. So there's like, oh, they don't talk. So there's there's kind of that balance of, and then finding how you want to supplement things if, if they're different. So um, I, I enjoyed it. I think it's really good. I think it's a huge improvement. So. And a couple of things I would add to that, um, if you look at the textbook itself, and this is chapter one, page one, um, in, in the textbook, and I'll try to get this closer to my camera, they have these little QR codes, and these little QR codes are free. The students don't have to be signed up for Launchpad to access these, but they are little videos that most of them, I haven't clicked on every single one, but most of the chapters have kind of a case example to highlight points in the chapter. And those QR codes take them to little videos. And so 
as long as they have a copy of the book, they can access those without having to have launch pad and pay the extra money and, you know, do anything like that. And so those might be something where, you know, you might ask them to, to watch the video and then you can have a class discussion about that video and everybody has equal access to that. Um, there is also a instructor resource manual that you can download from the textbook publisher website and it includes some some extra information it has i'm i'm scrolling right now through the the one for chapter two of the textbook um, and that particular one you know has uh different activities discussion questions that you might want to do um, has links to other websites. So for example, I'm looking at one right now that has a, a link to the Brain Observatory website and an article. And so like, you know, Larry teaching online, you could use that as one of the discussion prompts, right? Or if you're teaching asynchronously, Cheryl, because you get stuck at home and, you know, you're trying to come up with what's something we can all do when we're all scattered about, you know, turning to that instructor resource manual can give you some ideas um, that maybe you wouldn't have had before. We are not requiring students to purchase Launchpad. So don't build anything that depends on them having Launchpad. Um, you can access Launchpad and you can go in there and maybe find something that you could maybe kind of steal the idea of and put it in a Blackboard if you want, but for that. equity, the only thing they have to have is the book and they through the bookstore they have a couple of different ways they can access or purchase it and this is a question i've gotten over the summer from students so you may have gotten this as well the way it's listed at the bookstore is a little bit confusing in fact i'm going to open one up real quick here and present my screen so we can all look at it together so you'll understand what it looks like because the students are going to ask you questions they're going to be like i don't know what you're talking about <laughs> um, so let me just open one of our classes, um, the books link here, and then we'll look at it together. So Brandon, are you presenting? You're not. Okay. So let me change to present now. Come on. And so I don't know if you have looked at this or not. But in the online class schedule, there's a link for the students to click on to go look at their books. And so you can click on this yourself and you'll be able to see what the students see from their perspective. And so what it says is choose one of two. So they're only supposed to pick one, but they get really confused about these up here. Um, they can either get the book, the printed paper copy, and they can rent that new or used or buy it new or used. I'm not sure how many used copies we have. And they will have this in their hands, right? There is a digital ebook that is not through Launchpad. That is just an ebook. It's through a program called Brightwave that they can basically rent an ebook. So that's that's one way to get just the book. They also can purchase Launchpad. And it's a little bit different. Hold on just a second. One of my coworkers needs to leave the room. So go on. <laughs> um, so with Launchpad, it's different from Cengage. They don't do this subscription-based service, so they can purchase Launchpad. And what I've been telling my students is basically, think of Launchpad as an optional study guide. If you're the, and it's a digital study guide, if you're the type of person that would go in and do all of those activities and find it very beneficial, then go for it. If you're like most everybody else, just buy the book. Because if you look at the cost difference, um, Launchpad is like the most expensive way to get the book. Does that make sense? And then the other thing is that um, the APA 
style manual is listed as recommended. So it's not required. And part of why that's not required is because um, APA 7th edition, everything our students need for GenCite is available for free on the APA style website. apastyle.org. Um, and so if you go on here and you click on the style and grammar guidelines, what do they need to know? Well, I need to know how to do in-text citations. Click. It tells them how to do it. It gives them the base. I mean, like everything that's in that manual is available for free online. Don't need an account. You can just access that freely through the internet. And so we've kind of backed off a little bit on how much we're asking students to actually have that, that manual. Um, I'm, I'm telling my students, if you're gonna take a lot of classes that are psych classes, if you're gonna major in psychology, then you might wanna buy one because you're gonna get a lot of use out of it. For everybody else, which is the bulk of your students, there's no point in them spending money on the manual for the one class that they're going to take that's going to ask them to use APA style. So I did want to point that out about the, the bookstore. Um, and the other thing about the, the manual is the library has it for use in the library, but with the sharing of resources and the quarantining of library supplies for 72 hours after somebody uses something, I'm not sure how accessible stuff at the reference desk is gonna be. So that's another issue. Okay. Um, have we talked about everything we, we needed to talk about, Brandon? I don't have that document open right now. Or we I think have... so. Um, I just, I wanted to just uh, real quick and for the recording if someone watches this, uh, just show what I, some of the things I've done with Google Forms, just to give an example of what we talked about earlier. Oh, great. Um, and I was going to show an example of my first Google Form. I have my students do too, but you go ahead and go first. So. Um, this is what I'll do. most of my participation activities, and that's what I call them. Um, so I set up in Blackboard. Um, I now have under my assignment section, I have a link, I have a section called participation activities. So I started that last spring. I did this in the summer. So anytime I'm saying, um, right, today's participation activity, you just, they know, they go into this portion of Blackboard. Students who are in class, you know, they'll be on their phone or on their tablet or device, um, and they can do the in class. The students who miss class, they know here's where I go to find, you know, today's activity. Um, and there's a lot of cool options. You, you can play around with this. I don't know how familiar everyone is with, with forms. So, like, here it was on, you know, the personality chapter. I had them pick a defense mechanism, right, explanation. The theories, I didn't want them to pick a theory because I figured everyone would just pick Freud. Um, so to distribute it, I set it up like, what's the first letter of your last name? And then that assigned them to a theory. So everyone at A through E got humanized. So like I gave them a case example, and they're supposed to write a two to three sentence description. I call it, you know, practicing analyzing through their various theory. So that's, and then you can look at the responses. That's the, the other thing I love about Google Forms is then I have all the students' response, uh, responses. I can look through and see here's what students are writing about. If you're doing this live in class, you can give them, you know, five or 10 minutes, whatever, to write a response to a question. You can look through this and say, okay, here's a good example, or here it looks like we're missing a couple points here on this theory, whatever. Um, so it's, it's good both in person, immediate feedback and remote. Um, here you see like you can do um, multiple choice questions and you get the same type of thing. You can see, um, you know, are students on the right track where they, you know, how, what percentage of the class got it correct or incorrect, you can follow up with that. Um, 
was a lot. So here's a lot of multiple choice questions I did. Um, I do an activity with cognitive appraisals. Um, I like this one that like, I give them a scenario that someone stood them up on a date. How upset would they be? And so this is my summer class. There were only like, you know, eight students, so small sample. But this was had them do this once. And then like a week later, I had them practice cognitive appraisals and then rate like how upset they were then. And then it was much lower, like average in the district. So I'll, I'll show, I like the data collection component because I can collect that. And so like in this case, uh, I show them that, they, hey, we were over here the first time we did this. Now our average is right here. Um, there's a lot of, I think, interesting, useful tools you can use through Google Forms. They're very flexible for, again, if students miss class, they're sick, no problem. Make sure you're in black to complete today's participation activity. Um, and so what I'm going to do, um, some of those I have labeled just by the date, which won't be very helpful for you or I this semester. I'm going to go back and go through those um, and label them more topically, you know, chapter one, um, you know, research methods activity. And then I'll put those in a folder. So if you want to use them, you can, or if you want to open it up and then edit it, to, you know, modify it or just to give you ideas to create your own, um, those will all be available. So I should have those next week, a folder open, and then I'll put it in a Google folder so that as I update or modify things, or if I add a new one, it will be available there um, at any time. All right, and I wanted to show, um, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I wanted to show if, if you let me present my screen, come on computer. Um, I've been doing a lot with um, Google Forms, but also I, I do like shared Google Docs when we're having a, a discussion and things like that. But this is the Google Form I created for my introduction. So if you looked at my PowerPoints in the past, my first day of class, they introduced themselves with note cards. Um, I stopped doing that uh, a year or two ago, but I have this introduction thing and I like it because then I can see my whole class. I'm just going to show you what it looks like. Um, and it kind of lets me introduce myself uh, to the class as well. So I say, you know, your last name, your preferred first name. I tell them what I want them to call me. And, you know, I talk about how I was named. And I ask them to give me their pronouns and have information if you don't know about pronouns that you can link to. Um, and you can put in like little transition points. So I put in a vir virtual handshake because they're introducing themselves to me. So I, I wanna virtually shake their hands. Um, you can put pictures in there. So, um, you know, I've got the nice to meet you. Then I have another section that I tell them is private information. And this is where they can kind of share with me stuff about, you know, where that, what they're doing, but also personal things. And I tell them, I won't share this with, with the class. Um, and I put in a little picture there to just kind of break up the Google form a little bit where I'm like, here's a picture of one of my favorite places. And then the other thing I do with this one is I do some course planning. Like I ask them to give me my definition of development. And then during the live class, like Brandon, I will open that up. You can't see who said what. All you can do is see their different definitions. And we can talk through what is development and um, talk about, you know, where people are most interested in learning, which aspects of development, which part of the lifespan. So, it, it is really nice to, to be able to, to help you do those kinds of things. And I strongly recommend you include, and I'll find it here, uh, information somehow where they're sharing what resources they have at home for learning. So do they have a computer? Does it have a camera and a microphone that works? You know, what kind of internet do they have? That way, if the student ends up at home, you already know what kind of resources they have and aren't scrambling to try to communicate with a student that can't communicate with you because they don't have a computer or internet at home. Um, and so finding some way to do that. And then I also just wanted to guide, show you guys the Quizlet that I had talked about. So like I said, I have my first two already built. 
And so this is what I'm doing instead of my note card activity. Um, and they're going to do it outside of class. And then we're going to use their Quizlet they built in class. And so I already, yeah, go away. Um, I already loaded up the terms. And what I told them here is I said, select two terms that say write a question. And then they have to edit two of them to write a question. And I'm going to have them put their name there so I can keep track of who wrote rich questions. But I was able to quickly upload the list of terms from a Word document. So I didn't have to go in and type all those in by hand. And then they're going to go in and they're going to, you know, pick two of these to write a question to match. And then that'll let me do my normal in-class activity. So there's lots of different things. Google Forms, Quizlet, that, that can really uh, be beneficial. Leslie, while you have that open, can or never mind. I, I'll go back to it. I can do it now. Oh, you want to do it? Okay. So I just want to add, like, when you're using Google Forms, if you want to, so everyone knows, um, in the settings, if you want to collect email addresses, make sure you go into the settings and do that. And that will then automatically give you um, in the responses their email address, their Jeffco. Um, Can you like here, show them how to, to have them automatically, their responses automatically sent to them? Because I also do that when I do a Google form so that the student know what knows what they said. Do you do that? Uh, I do not. But. I, I do. Response receipts is what it's called. And right now it says if respondent requests it, I yeah. I try to turn that on so that anytime anybody submits a Google form to me, they get a copy of it and it'll go to their Jeffco email. Um, and so, you know, think about whether or not you want them to be able to access, you know, that Google form and what they said. And so I think if you're using it to help them study, it would be really beneficial for them to have what they said in their their participation activity offline to help them with their studies. Yeah, that's a great idea. And if you're using this, like, and you have the email, you could use this for attendance, for participation. You can go back and see, you know, everyone who, who completed the form. You have to add that in. And sometimes I have activities that I want it to be anonymous. So I make sure and turn that off. And I'll tell them, hey, I've Think of it's like we're talking about counseling or like psychological disorders. If I'm asking them to like, have you ever had a symptom of depression? Or if I'm asking them to think, share like a cognitive distortion they've had, I want them to know like, hey, I'm, I don't know who this is or what you're saying. I want you to be able to like openly, you know, explore some of these issues. So this, I'll say, I'm not collecting your information. This is for the confidential. Or if you wanted to use that for like some feedback, what could would you like to see improve what's something that didn't work for you? Um, if you want to use Google Forms for that um, and do so confidentially, um, you turn that off and then you can't see who submitted what um, material. Speaking of attendance, uh, <laughs> I always took attendance with a piece of paper right. <laughs> that passed around the room and people signed in on. Uh, try to think about how you're going to do that. So if you look at my syllabus, I say, there's going to be some kind of thing you do through an online application to record your attendance. And I haven't quite decided what it's going to be. It'll probably be a Google form or something where they have to like check. And, but I, I, you know, some way you're going to have to record who's there without them all touching the same piece of paper. <laughs> uh, what I've done in, oh, am I? Yeah, what I've done in the past, I just, I literally just open up. I, I don't know how it'll work. Face to face, it'll work fine because I just bring up the attendance on the computer and then I call out everybody's name. No one touch because I, I started with the, uh, you know, having a list of everybody's name, have them sign in. The problem then is I didn't do it later. Sometimes it's at night. Hopefully I didn't forget. This way I do it right at the beginning of class. It helps me get to know everybody's name in class. I indicate. I just check everybody off, update it. it, it's done. Nobody but me has touched everything. I don't have to worry about a piece of paper or a pen that everybody has touched and we're good. So that that's yeah. worked for me. I don't know how it'll be a little bit different. 
<laughs> the the semester. So there'll be a, I'll probably have a checklist or so. I just might print off a check. One thing I've done also is just um, I'll make a spreadsheet with everybody's name and then just have uh, and then just check everybody off. So mm -hmm. that'll work if they're if I'm checking two different places, I can see who's here face to face, who isn't here, look online, that whole deal. Uh, and I'll usually make some sort of announcement. Listen, if you're in class uh, and uh, like after I take the attendance of who, who I recognize, say, I don't know if I have everybody, but these are the people I don't have. If you're listening online or on the phone or whatever, send me a message so I know to mark your present. Yeah. And I think those are the things that you have to think about ahead of time, right? It's yeah. like, imagine all the possible scenarios. Um, it's about five minutes until four minutes now until the social hour is supposed to start. And, and Anastasia's giving away goodies. So I don't want you guys to miss that. Um, we're all available email. Um, we're, we're officially back at work next week. Um, but <laughs> you can't come see us because yeah. uh, we don't have offices set up for social distancing. Um, but if you if you want to set up Google Meets with me or Brandon or Amy, we're available. You can call. You can email. You can text. Um, we're we're all around and we're all figuring out together. <laughs> so I can't tell you how to teach a really great semester under these conditions because I've never done it. So we're all gonna just trial and error and and tell your students that I'm gonna be really upfront with my students and say, hey, if something is really working out well in another class, tell me. And you know, I'm willing to try different ways to, to run class. So any last thoughts, Brandon? The same thing. Um, you know, I'm, I'm gonna try the same thing, you know, encourage that I'll, I'll be flexible and then we're gonna we're gonna be doing the best we can to make it best out of um, desirable circumstances. I'm just gonna really stress that um, I will be highly flexible if you're communicating with me. Um, if you're not communicating with me, I'm not going to be that flexible. So um, I'm going to, you know, give examples in class and in my syllabus that, you know, when you haven't participated, you know, for example, for 30 days and then come back and say, oh, I was sick. I'm not going to have much um, sympathy or flexibility. But if you're emailing me that day and saying, here's the situation, you know, we're going to work with you. So just encouraging that communication and um uh, so, um, I think also if it hasn't been mentioned, you know, ch double check your room assignments next week. Yeah. Yeah. And I think Terry has been really, really awesome at informing us, at least me, because mine have switched a couple times. If your room's changing, I would double check the schedule to, because as one class fills up and another one hasn't, or flip, so there's been, I know, I think Cheryl, yours have gotten moved a couple times. Just make sure you know where you're going next week um, in case your room got moved and you weren't informed of that. How would we, where would we go to check that? I'm just curious. Um, go on the schedule um, and then click on your section and it'll say the room number online. Will it and be accurate? Whatever's online is accurate as of that moment. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I needed to know. Okay. I don't think that'll be an issue for any of us because Terry is amazing and on top of this thing, so I would double check that. Okay. Thanks for all your input. I, I really needed this today. Yep. Oh, yeah, thank and, you very much. And Cheryl, we'll get together next week. Um, are you going to do some revisions yes. based on today? Yes. So you just let me know after you've done the revisions and we'll set up a meeting. Okay. Sounds all good. Right. Enjoy the rest of your day. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, thank you all for being here. Hey, Bye. Thanks for everything. <laughs> yeah. Okay.